What is the measure of a marketer and advertiser today? Data, analytics, metrics aplenty, software suites with lavish king-sized spreadsheets. It seems that opportunities for reflection are everywhere. We should be more in tune with performance marketing than ever before. But the problem arises, and only in those that choose to question things when you ask, where's this data coming from? How much is real and valid? How much isn't? For digital advertisers today, that simple question is more than just an outline or a stencil. It's existential. There's almost $300 billion pouring into digital advertising worldwide in 2019. And a fair part of it is, well, fake. But not yours, right? You've taken this seriously. You've revisited the data. You track your marketing efforts. You know you have digital advertising partners you can trust, publishers you vet, right? You know the answer to combating frauds and liars and fakers online requires the same tactics that have always worked against con men throughout history. You do honest work, be remarkable, have integrity, and earn trust. Oh, and whitelist domains so you don't get spoofed in the long tail by .txt bot farms. But you knew that already, too. That's what we're talking about today on Lawsome. Digital advertising, marketing, fraud, and finding fortune beyond the botnets. Ready? Let's go. Lawsome. The podcast for law firms. Powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that never met a metric it didn't trust, but is always looking for some data to believe in. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in legal marketing and law firm development. I'm Jake Sanders, and I like the free in-the-room hotel coffee, and I'm joined by Paul Julius, who I'm assuming does not because no one likes the free in-the-room hotel coffee. I'll tell you what, it depends on the brand. Okay. Um, I, I noticed there, there's one that I that I actually did take a liking to that's called Torque. Torque coffee for when you need the boost. Which I think is probably the greatest name for coffee ever. And it's only found in hotel rooms. I've never seen it anywhere else. Man, they probably can't serve it anywhere else. It's like a legal barrier. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. give any torque out. You see what this kid stuff does to kids? Like iced tea and, you know. Are you chewing that? Good Lord. Oh, crunched it up. It's just all, <laughs> all around his mouth. Let's go. Smoking coffee. <laughs> all He's smoking his coffee. Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Ooh. Let's hit the brew button and tell people what they have in store today. All right, on the show, we cover an article about ad fraud, and then it's a mandatory modern marketing masterclass with Dr. Augustin Fu about digital advertising, how to make the most of your advertising budget by avoiding the bots and scammers. And then we get different answers to the same questions from our guest with five questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The Hot Take Buffet today is steaming with an article from... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter you guys don't care what's happening to the hot dick buffet people are going to start wondering what's what's the health inspection grade there um the hot take buffet today is steaming though with an article from digiday.com brought to you by torque coffee torque coffee for when you need the boost <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get through this now we're doing it now <laughs> oh i'm sorry jake go, go anyway that no i love it uh the article is entitled digital ad fraud is worse than ever so we're off to a pretty optimistic start with jessica davies article here i'll start with the beginning we'll provide some hot takes um she says the digital ad industry has long played whack-a-mole with fraudsters in 2019 will be no different. This was written in January. A mammoth mobile in-app fraud scandal unco uncovered in October 2018 was a stark reminder of how sophisticated and tenacious fraudsters are. While initiatives like ads.txt 
have helped reduce domain spoofing and reselling of unauthorized inventory, there's a way to go. In fact, some industry executives believe ad fraud is worse than ever. Quote, it's a daily hourly fight. Um, do you, Paul, some background here. What is this in-app fraud scandal that they were talking about? What they're doing here is they're using trackers, m- malicious trackers installed in these apps. Oh, okay. Um, and it captures the behavior of the app's human users and then uses this network of bots to mimic it. So oh. when, when we talk later to Augustine about, you know, bot farms yeah. and, and, and sites that are never meant for humans to actually see. Yeah. You know, or can't be. This, yeah. This is it. This, wow. this is where that stuff comes from. Oh, um, cool. And you don't. Like you think it doesn't happen or you think whatever, like, oh, bots, you know, they're just trolls or just these automated things. I mean, right. Is they're basically executing spoofed actual human behavior. So they're they're reloading these pages on these sites in a very sophisticated human like pattern. And every time those those sites or those apps or whatever it is loads, you know, that's another impression that just got sold. That someone's, you know, that's another, that's another penny in the coin purse. Um, and this is happening at a scale of thousands of pages a minute. And what's the problem is that the, the relationship that's at risk here with the market manipulation is the advertisers and the publishers mm-hmm. because it's getting skewed with wrong numbers. And so this, this article here uh, on Digiday it outlines a couple things, uh, you know, she, you know, she says approximately 20 billion is estimated to be lost. And then if you follow Augustine's um, research, it, it's upwards of maybe even $70 billion, you know, that's actually lost. You know, people aren't even tracking this properly. So, you know, but what I like is Jessica, you know, outlines this. Um, it's really technical, this article. So I wouldn't, I, if you're a marketer, go in here. But if you're a lawyer, just stay away. Um, hand it to somebody who knows this. Because, I mean, she's talking about supply path optimization when you're talking about the arbitrage of digital advertising. Yeah. Mm. But one point that was interesting that uh, we hear later is market fragmentation plays into the fraudster's hands. So when you're repackaging specific content and you're going to serve it to a whole bunch of different people off a, a whole bunch of different sites, it turns out that what that app um, fraud bot, bot, you know, pretending to be human traffic, it's going to these places and it's making it seem like this is actually happening, but it isn't. Mm. So it's really hard to tell what's the, the fix here. So my, my hot take from this is that it's a lot worse than, than she outlines, but the fixes that Augustine gives us later are way amazing because it harkens back to real marketing principles. And at the end, he gives two pieces of advice that I think are some of the best um, pieces of marketing advice that I've heard in years. And it's right at the end. So I'm just going to build that up for you kids. You got to you gotta hear the whole thing all the way through because it really is a masterclass. My hot take, I love it. Fraud's bad, but the way to serve it up, really easy. Do good content. There's places you can trust and partnerships you can trust. It just, it all fits together if you know what you're talking about. This is a good article to outline the reality. I'm thankful for it, but that's my hot take. What, what's yours, Paul? That was epic, what he, what he drops at the end. Um, I know. And especially, I don't think people understand just how jaw-dropping that is for us. Uh, uh, Jake and I, we've, we've managed millions of dollars worth sure. of ad spend. I mean, yeah. hands on, you know, in, in the trenches of Google Literally. and Facebook and, and, yeah. you know, Jake, you did, you did TV media buys, radio. I mean, it's terrifying. um, so this isn't just something like we look at, this is something that, that, that was, you know, we had to deal with. I mean, we mm-hmm. brought it up and I think to me, what really melted my head was in this article, she says, <coughs> sorry, approximately 20 billion $20 billion is estimated to be lost to ad fraud a year. Hmm. Now think about that. 
That's more, that's more than Elon Musk is worth. Mm-hmm. $20 billion is stolen. And honestly, it's not even a concern. Yeah, you, they think it's priced in, or and, and then we find out that may not be true. Um, well, that's exactly what they say. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, Dr. Fu says that that it's it's dismissed as as built into the cost. And you and I have heard that. Oh, it's you know what? There's just there's so many placements. We can't manage all of them. Um, <laughs> you got to be everywhere, though. And the, but that's at the same time. Right. I mean, look at look at it's 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 two sides of this coin. One side of it, you know, these people uh, and Google's guilty of it. Facebook is guilty of it. Uh, anybody who's selling programmatic advertising, you're guilty of it too. Sure. There's all these placements that are available. We have all of them, all this mm-hmm. inventory. Mm-hmm. It's flying out here at the speed of light, the mm-hmm. speed of gigabit internet. Mm-hmm. And no human can possibly manage and buy all these things that are available and sold in seconds. These, these, these split second, you know, single impressions bought and sold. Mm-hmm. So we've got this AI, we've got this thing that we're going to train. Right. And now here we get back to the thing of, well, what's it, what's it getting trained on? Because people are using these bots to spoof human behavior. And this is where all that falls in. That's why the continual focus of the show is how do you write your ads? Where is your strategy coming from? What, you know, the, the words you use, the placements you choose, the publishers and the relationships and the partnerships that you have with vendors uh, you, you know, who can help you get placements that you trust. You know, in TV, there were people that you sat down against the table and we talked about rate cards and day parts and what they owed and what was rating and what, what, what was showed and what was owed. And they had to look at me and understand that, you know, if what was reported didn't come back, then I was owed because there was money on the table. And that sort of evaporates into the pennies that sort of just invisibly support the idea of brand awareness online. The unfortunate problem is, is that existing marketing still works. Think about how fundamental some of the techniques he it goes into in detail. Right. Um, some of the, some of the advice and instruction he gives in detail it might seem simplistic, but keep that in mind when you're looking at this, this spoof and this bots and this stuff like that. Um, this technology is almost like slipping through our fingers. And that's where these fraudsters and scammers are making their money because it's becoming so complicated and so fast. And so, oh, shiny object, let's get in this and not really think about it too much. That's where there's room for trouble to happen, you know? Mm-hmm. And you have to have stopgap measures, people who know what they're doing. And this guy knows. I mean, yeah. he he doesn't only just report on the problems. He brings receipts and then yes. suggestions for how to fix everything. So this isn't doom and gloom. This is this is this is a Judy Bloom kind of novel that that yeah. I think exposes the mysteries of the tomb. And um, I'll, I I don't know if I can rhyme with tomb. Let's think of something. I mean, the point is. It, it it's not that it's bad. I mean, you don't, what he's saying is that there are, you know, solutions to this. There's a good way to advertise and it's not really that different from what happened in the past, but just, you just, you got to hear it. Yeah. Go, you listen to the interview and we're going to come up with a list of rhymes for the word tomb. See you soon. That'll work. Let's head over to the interview. Dr. Augustin Fu is an independent cybersecurity and ad fraud consultant who helps clients improve their marketing efforts by applying technical forensics to uncover digital ad fraud, threats to consumer privacy, and cybersecurity risks. Currently an adjunct professor at Rutgers University and NYU teaching digital marketing strategy, Augustin completed his PhD at MIT in material science and engineering at the age of 23 and holds a patent for a jet engine barbecue grill. He has over 22 years of digital marketing experience, starting at McKinsey & Company, and was most recently the chief digital officer at Omnicom's healthcare consultancy group. 
We're very grateful that he's taken a quick break from hunting down the internet bad guys to join us on the show today. Dr. Foe, welcome to Lawson. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Paul. Uh, glad to be here with you all. So let's start from the bottom floor. Uh, digital advertising is wildly complex, but there, there's got to be a simple way to understand it. Can you give us a brief overview of the digital ad environment before we jump into how people game the system? Like, just explain sure. the system. So it should be very simple. And if you think about the way the internet was in 1995, we'll just go all the way back there. All right. So it's basically when people go to websites and they look at web pages, then ads are going to be loaded on those pages. Right. That's the way it's supposed to happen. And uh, fast forward 20 years, uh, now it's become so complex, not because it had to become complex, but because a lot of the players make money in this complexity. Right? So there's a lot of middlemen that kind of inserted themselves uh, into the equation. So I'll use a very simple analogy. Uh, the original contract of the internet was between three parties, the consumer, the publisher, and the advertiser. The publisher would have a website where they put useful content um, that journalists or writers uh, wrote or created, and that would attract a human audience, right? And when those humans went to the site, the unspoken contract was uh, they would get that content for free in exchange for uh, seeing ads. And so the advertisers, in order to reach those human audiences, would go to those publishers and say, we want to buy the ad space on your site and put ads on there. And so that's basically the three-legged stool that was balanced, and that's the unspoken contract of the internet. In the intervening 20 years, uh, we've seen a fourth leg insert itself into the stool, uh, and that's the ad tech leg. And basically, that fourth leg has now not only thrown the stool out of balance, but pretty much wrecked it because that fourth leg is doing everything it can to take profits for itself at the expense of every single party, every other, you know, every one of the three other parties that were the original parties to the uh, unspoken contract of the internet. And so these ad tech companies are now saying, oh yeah, well we can, you know, help you with some magical technology to help you reach audiences on long tail sites and so on and so forth. And while there is a plausible, um, while there is plausible good that can come from that, mm -hmm. it's also opened the floodgates to fraud. And again, let me put the fraud simply: when you have ad tech that can be installed by any website started by anybody, then you know there's a ton of um, sites that are just created, and you just stick some ad tech on there, and you start running ad impressions. But obviously, those sites have no human audiences because they might not even have any content. So no human would ever go to them. So how do they sell so many ad impressions? They basically buy all their traffic. Right? And when they buy the traffic, it's basically fake traffic caused by bots. And bots are just software programs that just repeatedly load the web pages and generate billions upon billions of uh, ad impressions. So... Because of ad tech and because of this fourth leg of this stool, uh, everything is now gone to sh basically. Um, you know, all of these players are extracting profits for themselves, and it's thrown that balance out because now the publishers are not making money, right? And you've seen the studies over the years where every dollar the advertiser spends, uh, less than 30 cents makes it to the publisher. What? Every dollar the advertiser spends, uh, less than 30 cents makes it to the publisher. What? Every dollar the advertiser spends, uh, less than 30 cents makes it to the publisher. Right? Because the middlemen are extracting their profits, right? toll takers, ticket punchers, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and ultimately, the consumer is also now faced with an overwhelming amount of ads and things like that because uh, people were trying to solve problems that wouldn't have existed if the original contract of the internet still remained. And that's why you see the rise of uh, the use of ad blockers, tracking blocking, because now consumers are sensitized to the fact that all their um, information is being tracked and right. you know, bought and sold by ad tech third parties, and they have no consent, no control, and no recourse. Right. right? So 
I'll leave it there for for now. But you know, <laughs> well, it, it should I, be simple, but it's not simple. Exactly. You know, looking in like, what do we do about it? I, you know, you know, fraud. There's there's these these fake accounts. It seems sometimes there's fake outrage. Uh, it almost seems like though we just accept that there's a there's there's this element of fakery happening. You know, like we were talking yeah. a little bit. You know, before we got on the air. Um, it, it's almost like some of these programmatic companies are just like, what are you going to do? But it's so cheap. Who cares? Right. Mm-hmm, but yeah. I mean, we do care. We should care. Yeah. One of the common excuses I hear all the time is fraud is priced in. Right. And you might have heard that as well, but that's a complete misconception. I'll put it simply. Um, in the past, when you bought from good publishers, right? Like Meredith, Hearst, Condé, whatever, right? When you bought direct from them, I'll just use a round number. It's $35 CPMs, right? Okay. Now they say, oh, well, CPMs are $3 uh, instead of $35. So, you know, fraud is priced in. We don't care because it's way cheaper. But the flaw in that argument is that now you're buying 10 times the inventory. So you're not actually spending any less money right? You're buying a lot more inventory. And where the heck is all that other inventory coming from, right? So when you go into the long tail, the long tail is the long tail because it's supposed to be niche sites, niche audiences. Hey, everybody. It's Jake. I was editing this and I had to look up long tail because I didn't know what Augustine was talking about here. So according to mycustomer.com, Long tail marketing refers to the strategy of targeting a large number of niche markets with a product or service. It's mainly used by businesses that are dominated by a huge market leader. Facing a battle to grow, a company can shift their focus to multiple niche markets that have less demand. So on the, on, if there's an X, Y axis, the blockbusters will take uh, the left, and then a larger number of smaller brands will tail to the right. And that's the long tail. Okay. Let's get back to Augustine. So when you have a concept called the at scale long tail, something's wrong with that, right? So these long tail sites, um, you know, someone writes about fly fishing or cooking pancakes or something, you know, there's a niche audience. There's a small number of people who are also just as passionate about that specific topic, but there's not a whole ton of those people, right? But what, uh, ad tech has created is, oh, now we can you know help you reach audiences at scale in the long tail. And that's created the opportunity for some of these sites to come out of nowhere, right? So we've seen cases where the domain was registered a month ago, but now they're selling a billion impressions, right? How is that possible when no one's ever even heard of that domain? And that's because they use all fake traffic, all bot traffic, right? So but getting back to the point about these uh, misconceptions, right? They say fraud is priced in, but you know they're actually still spending the same amount of money, right? So they used to pay thirty dollars CPMs, now they pay three dollars CPMs, but they're buying ten times more quantity, so they're still spending the same amount of money. But the other ninety percent of the stuff is all fake, right? Because they're now going to buy these cheap, uh, low cost sites, uh, low cost ad impressions on these uh, long tail sites that have no human audiences. So a lot of those things are kind of made up by the media buyers, and it's kind of appealing to the marketers, right? I don't give the marketers a pass either because mm-hmm. a lot of times when the when I talk to brand marketers, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, we still want as much reach and frequency as possible, right? So they're looking for larger and larger quantities of impressions to buy, and they keep pounding their agency to get it at lower and lower cost. So when you do that, where the heck do you think you're getting all your inventory? where you get way more quantity at way lower cost, right? There's not enough humans on earth to generate that much uh, ad inventory because they're spending more time online, uh, on their devices, using social media, playing games, all that kind of stuff, right? That's plateaued years and years ago, right? So I recently put up a chart uh, that took the Pew Internet numbers because, you know, Pew Internet's been tracking humans usage of the internet and mobile and social for the last 20 years and uh in roughly the 10, 2010 to 2013 time frame all of those lines plateaued right so humans using the internet plateaued humans using mobile plateaued humans using social media plateaued right those are kind of horizontal but yet 
uh, digital ad spending continues to hockey stick upward. How the heck is that possible? Right. So a lot of marketers um, in shifting their dollars from other channels like offline, right, TV, print, radio, that kind of stuff, and shifting those dollars into digital, they still bring that reach, reach and frequency mentality into digital. So they're asking for more and more quantity at lower and lower prices. And so they are actually uh, supporting the proliferation of fraud. And also, it's some it's some paradoxical thing. They're also saying that I can serve individualized ads, so it's no longer a broadcast thing. Correct. So at Correct. once, it gives you this giant brand awareness because you can hit a million people for a penny, and then you can hit them individually at a million instances. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting paradox there that and, you sort of um, exposed. Correct. And that's another kind of misconception that's very popular among the marketers. And I think, it, you know, being here in the U.S., um, it's very much rooted in the more is better concept that everyone buys into here. Uh, so Costco, you know, like more mayonnaise, right? More, <laughs> yeah, five uh, gallons. You know, yeah, five gallon <laughs> mayo, right? Whatever, um, you know, That's is right. better. The, the point is here, uh, more is not better. And let me use a simple way to explain that. So we'll, we'll talk about targeting parameters because, um, you know, we've seen these data management platforms attempt to sell 300 targeting parameters, 500 targeting parameters. So let me play you through a, a thought experiment. So what if you have one targeting parameter, male versus female, right, gender? So if you just chose male, now I'm using round numbers, okay, you take your whole audience, it's 100%. And now you'd use one targeting parameter, which is gender, and you choose only to target males, right? So now you've cut your audience in half, okay? So that's 50%. And then now if you add on one more targeting parameter, say age range, and say for simplicity, there's five age ranges, right? And you just choose one to target. So that 50% just got cut in five, and now you're left with 10% of the original size of the audience. And say, for example, you wanted to target um, the eastern region, right, of the U.S. versus the west or whatever, right? Um, so now you cut that in, in four. So now you're down to a very small number, like 2% of the original audience. And that's only with three targeting parameters. What if you have five targeting parameters or 10, right? The size of the audience that fits all of those targeting parameters gets so small that there's just not enough people for you to target anymore. But yet, in ad tech, we now have people saying, oh, well, we can kind of surmise or deduce these other characteristics through something they made up called lookalike audiences. Oh, well, we think that if you know these audiences visit similar set of websites, um, that's a lookalike audience. So they're similar. So yeah, here's an at scale lookalike audience that you can target. And oh, by the way, it's really huge. So there's more for you to target and more parameters for you to use to target. So in those cases, basically, it's the myths of hyper-targeting uh, and the, the myths of behavioral targeting that, that are at play. And so the marketers, again, they buy into this BS. And uh, obviously, the ad tech companies will charge them more when they're selling 300 parameters to target instead of five. Wow. Right. So again, all of these things are built on misconceptions that more targeting is better. And just using that thought exercise, right, once you get beyond three parameters, five parameters for targeting, your audience sizes get smaller and smaller. So that's why ad tech had to kind of make up the, this concept of lookalike audiences so that they could continue to sell at scale BS to the marketers. And yeah. the marketers are very happy to, to buy into that. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I'm, I'm not. To me, whenever I've used a lookalike audience, I, I've, I've failed to see how, exactly how it looks alike. And it seems like a lot of these companies have some kind of, you know, quote, proprietary thing. Yep. Um, and and I, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Sure. Is if, if programmatic, you know, that's what I get sold a lot on. And I, I can't stand this. I think it's a lie. Um, but programmatic advertising where they say, um, we're going to develop these personas of your buyers and we're going to use our AI and machine learning to um, reach and take advantage of the you know tens of thousands of available ad inventory that's happening every second or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, number one, what you just said, I think, blows a major hole in that. And number two, something that's been bothering me is that if there's all this bot traffic out there, yeah. 
how is that? I mean, doesn't that just render any kind of machine learning AI just useless because garbage in, garbage out? It does. Very simple. So you're kind of leading the witness because that was a, that was a, the next thing I was about to say. <laughs> I was just going to say I, I may be doing yeah. that. No, no, but but let me let me explain a very simple example and also get into the uh, why the bots are doing this. Okay, so um, behavioral targeting means uh, if a user visited a collection of different websites, uh, we can kind of deduce what they like, right? So if they visit um, you know different sports sites. Uh, Sports Illustrated, uh, ESPN, maybe Playboy.com, whatever. Okay, we can kind of deduce that that's a male, right? Or if they visit a feminine hygiene product site and so on and so forth, we can deduce that it's female, right? So in those easy cases, that's fine. But what if you go to a new site? What if you go to Walmart.com or what if you go to Amazon? What the heck can you deduce about that user, right? Not much. So then they get into this fancy stuff like, oh, we'll use AI to figure that out. Okay, so that's leading to all the surveillance tech where they're tracking like what product you looked at, what search term you typed in, who your friends are, and all that becomes data that they supposedly use to do all this kind of magical stuff. But let me again simplify it with another example. When I was serving pharma companies, um, they would say, oh, yeah, we want to target oncologists, right, uh, because we have a cancer drug that we want to, you know, uh, let these oncologists be aware of. In the previous days, right prior to ad tech, um, you would uh, the pharma companies would go to uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology, New England Journal of Medicine, or some of these medical journals that mm-hmm. carried ads because they wanted they knew oncologists would go there. Right? And I'll just use the JCO example, Journal of Clinical Oncology. Pretty much every oncologist in North America goes there at least once a month because it's for their work. They have to, right? And there's about eight thousand oncologists uh, in North America. Um, what the bots are doing is they know that ad tech is tracking this. So they're going to go visit J- JCO, Journal of Clinical Oncology, New England Journal of Medicine, and a whole bunch of other oncology-related websites. So now in the eyes of ad tech, these bots have visited all these oncology-related sites. So therefore, they've got to be an oncologist, right? So now uh, those bots uh, are able to earn higher CPMs because retargeting CPMs tend to be higher. And the pharma companies will say, oh, well, if this user, meaning this cookie that's tied to this bot, visited all these oncology-related websites, it's got to be an oncologist, right? So we want, we're we willing to pay even higher CPMs to retarget them. And so that bot, after visiting these collections of sites to make themselves look like an oncologist, they would go visit a fake site to cause the ad impression to load on the fake site. Right? And that's how they siphon more dollars from the pharma companies thinking that they were targeting oncologists because of uh, behavioral targeting that the bots took advantage of. Right? And so that fake site is able to make a higher CPM because the pharma company is paying a higher CPM for retargeting. So in those cases, like you said, that's just a case example of where it's garbage data in because the bots know exactly how to trick your system to make themselves look like an oncologist. Or, you know, like when it's back to school season, they'll deliberately go look on, look at a backpack on Amazon. So they'll look like a back, you know, back to school in tender. So then, you know, all these different retailers rush and fall over themselves to um, to retarget these back to school in tenders and pay extra. And so when those bots go to fake sites, they're making a ton more money for those fake sites. Right. That's how the money gets diverted. Mm. So in Paul, Paul was, we were talking about um, fraud the other day and he said, just imagine if you only took like a half an ounce of milk out of every gallon of milk, mm-hmm. you might not notice that. You might not notice a little thing. So a penny here, a penny there. That's not what's happening. <laughs> well, That's so, not what's happening. So it's like the cow's not even real. So you're, no, no, you're, yeah, yeah. No, so, they're taking the entire gallon and then they're taking the entire gallon of milk and the marketers willingly hand it to them, right? So I had a cartoon <laughs> drawn up where it's basically the, the safe with all the, the gold inside that mu- the marketers put in there every year, right? So it's $100 billion in the U.S. of digital uh, ad spend per year wow. and $330 yeah. billion worldwide of digital ad spend. Amazing. So that's a pot of gold that gets replenished by marketers every single year. And that pot of gold is literally sitting out on the street and the marketers are begging the bad guys to come take it. 
And they even have fake security guards, i.e. the fraud detection companies, that are standing around there posing but looking the other way because fraud detection tech companies are not there to measure fraud correctly. They are there simply for CYA, cover your ass. <laughs> right? So the marketers will say, oh, well, I kept buying that because my agency kept telling me everything was fine. And the agency will say, we use every flavor of fraud detection. And they all said it was fine, right? Fraud was low. IBT was low. Do you, and do you think the fraud was low or do you think it's because they didn't see it? They couldn't detect it, right? So the fraud is not not there. Uh, it is actually there. It's just that the detection technologies are so inadequate, right? Bad guys have better tech and they know exactly how to uh, you know, go get by undetected. Right, so I kind of think of that as an unfair fight. So I, you know, there are some days when I do pity the fraud detection tech companies because it's an unfair fight for them. Right, so the bad guys have A/B tests to their bots. They know exactly which ones get by, right, undetected and gets marked as valid. Where so they they have goalposts, right? They know what to shoot for. Whereas the good guys, they literally don't know what they don't know, and they don't know what to look for. Because they don't know the next technique that the bad guys are using to trick their systems, right? So it is complete unfair fight for the good guys, right? They will never win. They are always going to be reactive. And you hear about all these zero days, right? I, I'm using a cybersecurity term, right? Zero days means this is the first day that you've discovered it, right? The good guys have discovered an exploit or vulnerability or a hole that mm -hmm. they didn't know was there before. But it's not like that hole just started yesterday. It's been there all along. The bad guys have been in your systems all along. It's only now that the researchers and the good guys discovered that there was a loophole there. Right? So same thing with fraud. The fraud has been going on the entire time. And the good guys haven't detected it. And that's why they're reporting 1% you know, IVT. And that's parroted by the industry trade associations, like the Association of National Advertisers, saying fraud is lower. Uh, it's great. It's going down. We're winning, right? At a time when marketers should be the most vigilant ever, not the least vigilant ever, because the amount of dollars at stake is the largest ever right now. So, so you, you keep mentioning Condé Nast and, and you, you have experience doing marketing. You mentioned this older advertising model where it was just sort of, you know, you had your ad, you had your agency and you had your publishers buying direct traffic from a TV station, a radio, a magazine, a newspaper. What, what are your thoughts on lawyers using traditional models and can you help explain why, why that advertising cost may seem very exorbitant, but it's actually more in parity to what you get back? It, there's a couple of very simple rules, right? Uh, you get what you pay for. So if you're paying $3 CPMs or $0.30 cent CPMs, you're getting crap. Okay, so there's no other way around it. Okay. Um, you know, the way I, re you know, I refer to those publishers as ones that have been around for a long time, right? They've been uh, publishing for decades. They've been around for a long time. And you can actually go to their offices and sit across a table from someone to talk to, right? Unlike in programmatic where the ads are bought and sold and you never know even which site your ad's going to end up on anyway, right? Mm. That's really the problem. So these publishers have real content on their sites and apps uh, that real humans want to read, right? So they have real human audiences. And if I were an advertiser, especially a bigger one, I would literally go to all of these good publishers that I can sit across the table from and buy up all their inventory. Because if I did that, then I would guarantee that my ads are at least being shown to humans and not some of this other shenanigan stuff that's happening, right? Um, so I would avoid ad tech in its entirety. Now, my critics will say, oh, well, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not saying that programmatic technology is bad. I'm saying that the technology has been used by bad guys to rip off a lot of people, right? So the technology itself is not bad. And in fact, even when you buy from a Hearst or Condé, Condé Nast or whatever, the ads are still going to be placed programmatically. That's the technology. It's still placing the ads on an impression by impression level. So we're still doing programmatic, but you're buying from a publisher that's actually trying to do the right thing. 
So this gets to kind of a non-technical uh, example, right? There are good publishers versus um, the, the sites that carry ads, right? I call them sites that carry ads and not publishers because they don't deserve to be called publishers. Many of those sites, basically some of these celebrity sites and whatever, you know, it's basically 100% plagiarized celebrity images, right? And they're using 100% plagiarized content in order to attract human audiences, in order to sell ads and things like that, right? So the good publishers are doing everything they can to do the right thing. And they have business pr uh, processes and business practices in place to reduce any kind of bot traffic. They won't even show ads to visitors coming from data centers or search crawlers and things like that, right? So you want to find a publisher that's doing those things. And you want to avoid those sites that are literally out to cheat you, right? They're buying traffic. They're refreshing the page uh, every 30 seconds. They're refreshing the ad slot every five seconds, right? So they're doing all these things that are either gray area or outright fraud. So you want to avoid those categorically, right? And so that's why I keep referring to big publishers, because in most cases, those publishers don't have a ton of bots coming to their site. And that's because they don't buy the traffic. Um, and the reason there's not a ton of bots going to those sites is because the bots can't make money when they go there, right? If an ad loads on a Hearst website, Hearst makes the money. So these fraud bots are not going to waste their time going to load a whole bunch of Hearst web pages. They will spend their time loading web pages of the sites that pay them for the traffic, right? And so this boils down to something very simple. It's just arbitrage, right? Mm -hmm. So if that site owner, right, they have no human audiences, uh, so they have to buy all their traffic. They, they just do a very simple calculation. If the cost of buying the traffic, for, just use round numbers, is 10 cents, right? Uh, and they can make a dollar uh, for every ad impression uh, they display, then uh, the margin is 90%. I should say every thousand ad impressions that they split, display, right? So mm. uh, the margin is 90%. So they can do those. And even if the margin's less, it's still pure profit because they didn't actually create content and all the, maintain a site and things like that, right? So all of those sites are there to arbitrage this opportunity because marketers believe they can get a ton of quantity in the long tail. Whereas if you really dismiss those myths and misconceptions about ad tech uh, and you buy direct from the publisher, the, the most fundamental thing is showing your ads to humans first, right? And all of that has to happen. Like uh, avoid the fraud first, uh, show your ads to humans and not to bots first. And then you can talk about viewability and then you can talk about brand safety and then you can talk about how long the ad was in view and then whether the creative worked or not. Because right? if you don't solve the fraud problem, if you don't make sure your ads are shown to humans instead of bots, then you have every other problem like faked clicks, faked analytics, all of those kinds of things to the point where you can't actually uh, analyze and optimize anything because everything is fake. Right. So in my mind, there's a there's a clear sequence of steps that marketers should take when they're doing digital advertising. Excellent. And that's why you've heard me say the kind of digital stuff that we're doing right now is not real digital advertising. Right. It's complete BS. Right? Because none of the analytics are real. I can't even do my job as a digital marketer if the analytics are all wrong because there's a whole bunch of fake clicks in there. Right? I have to <laughs> clean all that up before I can even do real optimizations. Well, I, so I'm thinking about like, a, you know, before, I, you know, Google, I think, could be considered programmatic, even though they don't call themselves that because they yep. do all that stuff, you know, lookalike audiences, interests, affinity, custom affinity audiences. Yep. Um, way back when I first got into it, you the way to do it was um, pick a couple sites that, that you thought, based on research, your consumer would be headed to. And as you got results back go contact the, the, the most productive one and make a deal straight with them and take Google right out of it. Um, so it was almost like Google was like a, uh, like a sandbox. Um, yeah, I don't see that happening now. And I also, as much as I would like to say, you know, well with Google cost per click, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, 
they don't seem to do a very good job of staying in front of this. I mean, Jake, how many times have we gone through a placements report and seen websites that were clearly never yeah. intended for any person mm-hmm. to ever visit oh, or yeah. see? Oh, and yeah. Oh, yeah. And they take one down today and there's a new one tomorrow. So oh, I don't know. More. But and, mean, and, and on the other side of that are 10 yeah. marketers who are showing yep. some decent growth, you Absolutely. know? So you're just like, mm, I mean, they live to market another day, yeah. <laughs> but well, 18 so months, eight, 18 months down the road, they're going to get the, the guillotine well, because you yeah. didn't connect it to real stuff. Correct. Right. Correct. And I think, I think there's part of it that that's frustrating for me. And I, I just kind of wanted to build on uh, uh, what you were saying was that, you know, I, I'm trying to look at this thing and go to my shareholders and say a 3% click through rate is really good but the reality is those metrics are just founded on a lie there's so right. much of that stuff where it's like no actually if we were going to websites that people actually clicked on yeah. our click through rates would be much higher but we're okay to just settle for this stuff because there's so much crap floating around that we have to deal with yeah let let me unpack that uh, there's uh, quite a few concepts in there. So first, the marketers are not truly tying it to sales right. because they're too damn lazy to do that. So <laughs> it, it's using, hard work, man. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It really is. And you know, there's a convenient uh, standby excuse that a lot of brand marketers will use to say, oh, well, we sell soup in the grocery store, so we can't tie our digital marketing to lift and sales. Okay, wow. so if you can't tie it to sales, then don't do it. Right. But <laughs> yeah. anyway, their badge of honor is how much money they spent. Right. And their goal by the end mm. of the year is to spend it all. Interesting. And their their bosses haven't asked them to show that they drove sales. So all their gold on is how much brand awareness did you get? Right. And, and the proxy for that is how many ad impressions did you buy and so on and so forth. Right. So we end up using these uh, fake quantity metrics and click through rate is still the 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 biggest sin. Right. So a lot of marketers believe that if we get higher clicks and higher click through rates, that my campaign is working. And just this morning, I heard, you know, an agency in their pitch deck say, oh, well, 10 percent, you know, is is our kind of benchmark click through rate that we want to achieve. And for the next campaign, you know, we have a stretch goal of getting that to 15 percent click through rates on banner ads, by the way. Whoa. Um, So they clearly don't have a clue about what they're doing, or they're literally out, outright ripping off their client. But I'll leave that for another day. So these uh, quantity metrics like clicks are, you know, are now the metric that a lot of marketers mistakenly use. And there's too many young marketers out there uh, that really don't have the experience or historical experience to know that banner ad click through rates are supposed to be in the 0.1% range, not mm-hmm. 15%, not 30%. Right. So those things, now that they are kind of addicted to those uh, click through rates and they've reported those to their bosses, they're not going to be okay with a campaign that actually is showing actually realistic click through rates, right? Um, Of say 0.1% or somewhere less than 1%. But kind of tying this a little bit back to what you said about Google. Um, I have to bring in the concept of walled gardens, right? So that's been a derogatory term that agencies created to kind of blame Google and Facebook and try to make them the culprits. But you have to think about walled gardens in two parts, right? So on Google, there's the part, uh, you know, where the ads actually run on Google.com. Uh, if the ad loads on Google.com, uh, this kind of fraud is not as rampant because, again, the bots can't make money when the ad loads on Google.com. Whereas on the search partner network, right, all the other sites outside of Google that run ads, uh, either display ads or search ads, that's where all the fraud is. Right? So you have to divide Google into two parts, the on the main site versus everywhere else. right? And everywhere else is where all the fraud happens. And same thing with Facebook. If the ad loads on Facebook itself or in its app, it's probably fine. And you're not going to have this kind of rampant fraud with the bots and all that because, again, the bots can't make money from that. Whereas if you talk about FAN, Facebook Audience Network, which is all the, all the sites outside of Facebook that use their tech to run ads, that's where all the fraud is. Right? So if I were to simplify this for a marketer uh, and give some recommendations, mm. first would be – Use search ads, but 
uh, only on Google, turn off uh, search partner network, right? Don't let your ads go anywhere else. Then you're much less prone to click fraud. If you want to do display ads, uh, do it on Facebook and make sure you turn off FAN, Facebook Audience Network. And over the years, you know, we've seen many small businesses basically be threatened by Facebook to say, well, if you turn off FAN, you're going to get far less impressions, far less clicks. Your click through rates are going to drop to the floor. And of course, that's going to happen because all the clicks you were getting from FAN sites are all fake clicks anyway. Right. If you turn that off, your clicks and click through rate is going to go way down. But that's more realistic because those are humans that are actually clicking on your ads. Right. So if you do that and you turn off FAN, I've had several cases now, small business owners uh, and others that, that track all the way through to the performance, right, to the conversion events, uh, the claim form and things like that. We can see a 10 to 40 times better outcome, uh, you know, using Facebook display ads compared to display ads anywhere else, right? So Facebook ads, if done correctly, meaning turn off FAN, uh, does very well because of the targeting and all that kind of stuff. Right? So search on Google, display ads uh, on Facebook. Again, turn off everything else outside of uh, these two, uh, the two main properties. And then video ads on YouTube. And a way to avoid uh, brand safety issues is just carefully choose the channels on which your ads uh, should run, right? Kind of whitelist the channels, and then you're fine, right? Because these are the places that humans actually go. Right, and then you can also uh, do some buys with uh, uh, with the publisher, the, the good publishers that I mentioned before, because they're actually trying to do the right thing, and they also have human audiences. And so it's really should be that simple for a marketer. <clears throat> so g- getting back to legal in specific, a lot of uh, you know, it's some of the most expensive keywords. You know, search engine marketing is very. I think it is probably the most, if not. For, I mean, maybe you know, but. Um, <clears throat> How do you, it's hard to tell lawyers who have spent money to educate themselves and now have to run a business, you know, solos or small firms, Mm -hmm. you know, and then to tell them like, Hey man, (laughs) you know, I need to, I need to take some of your money and I'm going to turn it into money for you. Like selling people advertising and marketing is, is, is difficult. It's It's hard because it, this stuff does work. I'm so thankful. You're like, yeah, Google works if you do it right. Facebook yeah, works if it you do it work, right. YouTube you know. works if you do it right. If you know this stuff, because Consult Webs, you know, who who kind of you know keeps the lights on for this podcast, we that's what we do, yeah. and it it works. But <clears throat> it's hard to explain to a solo who would say, you know, just an example from real life. This solo lawyer paid seven hundred dollars to get some leads. Um, get some traffic, you know, just get some boost and and none of it came back. And so she says, well, yeah. marketing and advertising doesn't work for me. When you yeah. realize you actually have to pay for what you want and pay for what you get. So just yeah. kind of like speaking directly to lawyers who, who are looking for, if you're a New Orleans personal injury attorney, you might have yeah. to spend $800 a click. Yeah. Explain so, that wizardry and then kind of make them feel yeah. okay about it. You know, <laughs> So let let me say I can empathize because I'm a small business owner and have been for 20 years. There right? you go. So I have the same uh, exact needs, right? If I spend $50 and it doesn't return anything to me, I can't spend the next $50, right? So I can totally understand where they're coming from. So in this case, I would just tell them there, there's two things. First, don't compete against national advertisers and don't compete against cheaters, right? So there are people who will drive up those CPCs, especially in these categories, to $300 a click. You don't need to be competing with that. So if you're a lawyer and you can only serve New Orleans, right, make sure you add in some, uh, you know, geofencing kinds of things, right? You don't need a person that's out of your jurisdiction, if you will, who's never going to buy from you anyway, click in on your ad for $300 CPC and then wasting your money, right? So you advertise to the right people and through targeting and through the magic of programmatic, you can. Right. So you only need to advertise to the people who could even be interested in your service. And the other thing is what too many small business owners uh, don't do well is um, they don't balance uh, paid advertising with content. So they think that if they just pay for the advertising, uh, they'll get the traffic and whatever. But 
uh, you know, you know, if if you drive someone to your site and the content on your site sucks, uh, you're actually going to pay more, right? Google's algorithms will make you pay more because you don't have the content to go with the thing that they click through to get, right? So a lot of small business owners have underspent on content marketing, right? Which means they actually have to write some kind of content to put on their sites before they do the paid marketing, right? Search or otherwise to drive people there. Because if you do the search marketing and you got to click and someone arrives on your site and your content sucks, you're going to do more harm to your own brand than anything, right? So you don't actually want the person to come to your site unless you have something there that's worth their time and worth their reading. So a lot of small business owners need to find a better balance, right? Instead of just thinking it's magical, you just spend some dollars over here and you get some traffic and then you'll that lead to uh, clients and all that kind of stuff. The way I do my business is I've been publishing content right? because I have data. I look at data all day long. Mm-hmm. And these days it's all inbound. I don't have to pitch. I don't have to go to events. I don't have to sell because if someone were actually interested in ad fraud, they can just Google ad fraud and they will find my content from the last seven years. So lawyers and small business owners, when they start out, think about creating some kind of content that uh, shows what they do and what they specialize in, right? Because again, you know, I'm a fraud researcher. I've seen too many LinkedIn profiles where some of the stuff on there is outright fake, right? So people will say, oh, I went to Harvard Business School and they didn't go to Harvard Business School. There's no record of them ever (laughs) going there, right? So in those cases, I treat all LinkedIn profiles as fake anyway, because it's stuff that they can write and they can tell you they're a specialist in this, this, and this. True. Um, So for a lawyer, if they are a specialist in this, this, and this, they should actually write something thoughtful about it so that when someone reads it, they'll say, oh, they actually know what they're talking about. So let me contact them. And and that's how you get the lead. And that's how you get a potential client, right? Mm. Not because you said, I'm the best whiz bang lawyer on this, this, and this, and you you run a whole ton of ads. That's not going to get you clients. So, you know, long story short, it's about a better balance between paid media and content. Um, and they actually have to get the content on their site or on their LinkedIn profile first before they start driving traffic to it. Otherwise, it's going to have a uh, you know, more harmful effects than beneficial effect for them. So, so how do you, you must, you must do private consultations. You must look at people's dashboards and just gasp in horror as they show you <laughs> what they've done. Yeah. Um, how, how can people find you and connect online and, and, and get some of this um, amazing uh, how can they connect with um, you, Augusta? Well, there's a couple of things. I've written a lot of stuff. So on my LinkedIn, again, just Google my name, Augustin Fu, F-O-U. Um, and then you'll see my articles on LinkedIn. There's over 200 of them. And then over the years, uh, I've published a lot of slide decks. Uh, there's over 700 of those on digital marketing and uh, fraud in particular recently. So if they want to read any of those things, you know, if if they think that I'm saying something worthwhile, then they'll contact me, right? All my numbers and emails and all that are, are all over those PowerPoints. But if they think I'm, you know, if they don't agree with me or they don't think I'm saying something that's useful, then they won't contact me. So that's kind of putting the money where my mouth is, right? Uh, I've put the content out there. If you believe what I said, or if it makes sense to you, then contact me and I'll help you. Five questions we ask everyone. What was the last book you read? Uh, I don't read books. Perfect. Good. Number two, what is your favorite place? Freedom, Maine. And nice. it's because uh, there's the Lost Kitchen. Um, it, you know, Google that. You'll, you'll find it's pretty cool. Um, you know, she basically is a small business owner. Uh, she went through some hard times and then she found at this restaurant. And now it's one of the, the best uh, farm to table uh, places. So if you look at my Twitter profile, you'll see GPS coordinates. So that's kind of a, you, now you know what it means. It's a, uh, it's a okay. tribute to, uh, to nice. Lost Kitchen. Dude, that's awesome. That's uh, awesome. Number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Yours. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> yes. Hell yeah. Um, you know, I, I 
I read a whole bunch of stuff every day. Um, and you know, my Twitter feed and my followers help alert me to things that I need to pay attention to. And same thing with LinkedIn. So, um, you know, I, I learn a lot from my community. Uh, and then if I have questions, I can always go to, uh, go to the community and you've seen me tweet like blue team. So there's, uh, yeah. there's some security researchers specifically, you know, there's a lot of intersection between fraud and cybersecurity. So when I see something in the code that I don't understand, there's a lot of blue team members uh, that I can go ask and they help me with, uh, figuring out what the code means and stuff like that. Nice. All right, here we go. Number four, if you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? One condiment. Um, miso paste. Nice. Perfect. I'm a chef, and uh, you know, for a lot of vegetarian dishes, it adds the umami that uh, you need when you don't have uh, meat or anything to work with. Agree. Yeah. I have to check that out. My daughter just recently decided to, to go vegetarian, so I'm always oh, yeah. looking for tips. Um, okay, last one. Number five, after a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Uh, go walking with the family. Uh, so, you know, there's uh, the, the whole ring, the six-mile ring around uh, Central Park. So we've done that with the whole family, either biking or walking. So uh, it's, that's how we uh, relax. For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay lawsome.